We know guest services is important in any business. I think about what happens when I go to a restaurant or a store where the food is wonderful or the selection of products and apparel is high quality and offers a wide variety. But then the waiter's rude. It doesn't come to fill up my drink consistently. Or when we go to a clothing store and there's no one to open up the fitting room or find my size. No matter how high the quality of the products or how great the food, I will think twice about going back. I mean, there are restaurants, I love the food, but the customer service is terrible. And so I think I'm probably gonna go someplace else. But you know, the opposite is also true. If you live like we do here in Polk County, you know the motto of our hometown grocery store, Publix. Publix, it's where shopping is a pleasure. And I know people who will pass by other grocery stores that have cheaper prices with the same selection. They'll pass by those stores to go to Publix because of the experience. Shopping feels like a pleasure there. And the employees are trained to embody that motto. Now here at First Presbyterian Church in Lakeland, we aren't a business. And our motivation isn't the bottom line or profits. So some people might think we shouldn't treat people like customers. And you know what? They're right. The people who worship here on Sunday, they're not consumers. They are much, much more than that. And so we have an even better and more profound reason to treat each other and every person with friendliness, kindness, and warmth. This is especially true when it comes to children and families. Our motivation for this whole course, our motivation for being kind and warm and generous, it comes directly from scripture. Hebrews 13 verse two says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. The biblical word for guest services in the church, yeah, there is one, it's that word hospitality. Literally in the Greek, it's the word philozenia, means love of strangers. This was an incredibly important word in the life of the early church because this was a new movement and a movement that was really confusing to a lot of people. People didn't know what this Christian thing was all about. There were rumors and misunderstandings. And one of the ways church leaders tried to assuage the fears of outsiders was through hospitality. And the writer of Hebrews says that we don't know who we are loving when we're showing philozenia, when we're sharing hospitality. It could be angels. Now, some have made this out to mean that we could actually be talking to and sharing coffee and donuts with angelic beings. And it could mean that. But it could also mean that we don't know the impact of who we're reaching. The word angel means messenger of God. And who knows what that child or parent we greet with a smile will turn out to be for the kingdom of God. Think about the people who greeted Billy Graham at those revival meetings in Kentucky in 1934. That was the moment he credits as leading to his conversion. Think about the warmth of the fellowship and the hospitality that nurtured Rick Warren or Elizabeth Elliot in their faith. These modern messengers of God started as recipients of hospitality. And, and we can carry with us the spiritual gift of a smile, and it can yield eternal reverberations. I hope you're watching this today because you want to join us on the journey of welcoming little children, just as Jesus welcomed us, even though we're messy. I know you might be thinking, I just signed up to help with crafts or music or to be a host. But no matter what position you signed up for, you're gonna have an opportunity to have influence that can make or break a, a child or adult's experience at FPC. So this is for all of us because we're all called to be that welcoming presence. I pray you're ready to have a heartwarming and critical part of a child's adventure of faith in Jesus. This brief training in being a hospitable per, a, a presence, it's not exhaustive, but it should set us up to be a people who smile together, who smile toward others with genuine 
spirit-filled affection. As we get into the heart of this training video, I want you to remember one simple word, smile. Every letter in that word will guide us through the basics of what we hope to convey to every single person who comes to our children's ministry. And this particular acrostic also reminds us that the expression on our faces, it conveys as much as the words we speak. A smile is powerful because it can put people at ease. A smile communicates, you can talk to me, I care. A smile is a simple but profound act of hospitality and it's something we can all do. So as we unpack each letter, I hope you have a smile on your face thinking of the impact you might have in the lives of a child or their families. From the moment parents and children walk through the doors here to the time they come to this very desk to check in or check out their child, they're, they're subconsciously asking a couple of questions. Does someone care about me? Do they value my child? Do they value my family? We can communicate that we value them with our attitude to people in general. That's why the S in smile reminds us to really see people for who they are. Every single person we engage with is someone made in the image of God for whom Jesus Christ has died. Every single person has a story. Every single person has a history and a background. One of the world leaders in providing a great guest experience is the fast food restaurant Chick-fil-A. And that's an industry that's not exactly known for great customer service. The priority of most fast food restaurants is simply speed, efficiency, cost savings. Not taking real time to know and care for their customers. During the following video from Chick-fil-A, notice how they communicate the value of an individual and what each individual brings to their restaurants around the world. How they see their customers, even when they don't know them personally. Watch this video from Chick-fil-A.
You know, every single person comes to our building with a background and with baggage. They come with joys, fears, hopes, anxieties. Some come in after having a fight with their spouse, and yet they still manage to get their kids to church. Some are struggling financially, but they're here. Maybe they feel like failures as moms and dads. Maybe they're waiting for test results for themselves or for their children. Some have their hands full every single day with overloaded schedules, and they come here for a respite, a chance to worship Jesus with other believers and lay all their stresses down at God's feet. We may never know the individual stories, but we can imagine them because we've all been there. We've come to this place hurting before, but trying to fake it till we make it. And we now get to be people who act as a comfort to others in the middle of their hurt. We get to be encouragers when others need to be lifted up. We get to show them that we see them, we notice them. And so we have the opportunity to be the voice of Jesus offering safety, acceptance, and love. Now again, we may not know what each person is going through, but if we see them as people with complex and nuanced stories, then we realize that our actions and our words and our demeanor can make or break their day. That's why we commit to seeing them as they walk through these doors. Right now, I'm standing in one of our children's ministry rooms. This is where the kids sing and dance on a Sunday morning. This is where they hear the gospel message and where they may play a silly game to get their wiggles out. Parents, you know how important that is. This is a place for kids to have fun while the seeds of faith are being planted and nurtured in their lives. And it's a place for parents to know their kids are secure and being enriched. But not everyone knows that when they come in this place. Even families who are regular attenders may come in with nervous children struggling from a hectic week. Our role then is to manage the experience for all of them. That's what the M in SMILE stands for, manage the people's experience. We can do that by, by striving for excellence in everything we do, and knowing that we're doing this for Jesus himself. This is one of the reasons we wear these brightly colored shirts that literally say we heart kids. This is why we are on the lookout to improve our signage and communication with parents so that it's easy for people to identify the right places to go, the right people to talk to, to help with their children. And it makes it all the more important that every single volunteer comes in with a posture of friendliness, knowledge, and warmth. If you think about some of the businesses that we highlighted earlier, think about how they manage the experience of every guest. At Chick-fil-A, the employees say, it's my pleasure. They communicate that no bird at request is a burden. What do our words and posture say to others? Does it communicate it's my pleasure or it's my burden? Are we distracted on our phone? Are, are we getting stuck in a conversation with an old friend while a new person who looks confused is waiting for someone to notice them? We have to remember that the vast majority of what we communicate to others is nonverbal. Yeah, what we say with our words, that matters and what we say with our expressions, our stance, and our engagement, or lack thereof, matters all the more. At Publix, they manage the experience with their motto to make shopping a pleasure by training staff how to engage customers. I can't tell you how many times I've been looking for something specific on an aisle, and an employee will ask me, unprompted, can I help you find anything? Yes, I, I need to find Tabasco sauce, specifically the Chipotle flavored kind. That's my personal favorite. And quite often when they answer, they don't just tell me where it is, they'll actually take me there. And if one of them doesn't know the answer to a question I might have, they find someone who does. When we adopt this same perspective, we can manage the experience of every single person that comes in. We can manage the expectations of those who walk through our doors. And that leads to the next letter in our acrostic. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a fan of the Alabama Crimson Tide football team. Roll Tide. And I've been to several games at Brian Denny Stadium. 
One thing every sports fan knows is the impact of that home field advantage. The impact it has on opposing teams and their supporters. In fact, at Alabama's football stadium, the opposing team's locker room is literally called the fail room. They have a sign above the door. Now it's named after a generous donor who was actually named James Fail. And he also had a pretty good sense of humor. If you're taking this training and you're already a part of FPC Lakeland, you have the home field advantage. But we don't want guests to fail in their entry to this congregation. We want them to have a positive, uplifting, and welcoming time here. And, and so for those of us who have the whole home field advantage, we need to do the work of reaching out to those who look like they may be lost or confused or just generally need help. That's why the I in SMILE stands for initiate. We want to be the sort of people who initiate relationships with others, not the other way around. It's on us to make the first move and not wait to be engaged. Newcomers, they don't want to feel like a burden or inconvenience. So we can reach out to them before they feel like they have to reach out to us. But in order to initiate those relationships, we have to develop some key observational skills. First, we have to watch people's faces and their posture. Are they looking around, confused, looking at signage or, or directional markers? Do you see them head up the hallway only to double back because they seem like they don't know where they're going? This is an opportunity to ask them if they need help finding one of our programs, one of the spaces where those programs exist. Do we see parents have their hands full with kids and diaper bags and snack bags? That's our opportunity to initiate a relationship by lending a hand. It's so powerful when someone approaches a parent with full arms and just says, hey, let, let me take that bag for you. It puts them at ease and it creates an opportunity for a further conversation. We have to observe, are people hanging back? Is there a kid in the program off in the corner not wanting to participate? We can initiate that relationship by asking if they're okay, if they, if they just wanna sit and talk. We're gonna get more into the value of listening in just a moment. But again, we don't know the parents' stories. We don't know the kids' stories. Yet God has put us where he has put us to stand in the gap. We may not know why a person is acting the way they are, but we can still show them the initiating love of Christ in our approach. Second, initiating relationships means learning the value of encouragement. For those who are volunteering directly with children, we can initiate a relationship with them simply by telling them they're doing a great job with a craft or a game. Kids love hearing that. And don't underestimate the value of a good high five. Kids like to give high fives. It's also good to be ready with a compliment for the kids and their parents. With the parents I interact with at our Little shepherd, Shepherd's Chapel time, I try to let them know when I see their child behaving in a sweet or, or kind manner. Parents feel like someone noticed their hard work as parents. Initiate with the kids and the parents by helping them, by being an encourager, and by being a cheerleader. Look, it's, it's not easy for everyone, and I get that. So maybe it's helpful to come up with a script for yourself, a, a, a list of compliments that you can offer kids and parents, a list of easy questions to ask those kids and their parents, even if it's just, are you having a good weekend? This can facilitate a conversation with them and deepen relationships from surface level to something more. Now, of all the things that we talk about in this training, initiating relationships might be the toughest for some of you. Some of you, it might be very easy. You're initiating relationships left and right. You never meet a stranger. But for others, it might not be. I understand. There are times for me when approaching a person I don't know can be kind of difficult. It's important then to begin each volunteer opportunity with prayer. Pray for God to give you the eyes to see people who are in need and give you the words to say when you approach them. And get, again, prepare yourself with a script of compliments and questions that break the ice. And 
have a ready smile and a greeting to introduce yourself. Having that advanced thought and planning and covering it with prayer can give you the confidence you need to approach just about anyone. As we initiate the first level of these relationships, it's important to have a posture of openness. That's why the L in smile reminds us to listen. We might notice people say they're confused with the check-in process, or they have questions about other aspects of the church, or they just want to share something about their child. Maybe it's an allergy that they have, or maybe they've been sick, or had a problem in school, or maybe it's something positive, like a new accomplishment or a special occasion to celebrate. Other times we have to listen with our eyes. Now, I, I know biology, we, we don't listen with eyes, but it's still that observation that's important. We make these observations with our eyes and it informs what we hear with our ears. By looking at people's posture and the nonverbal cues, it can tell us a huge amount about where a person's at with their life. If a parent has slumped shoulders or herky-jerky kind of movements, if their words say, I'm fine, but their face says, I want to scream at my children, we know it's time for us to step in to help. Only when we listen carefully in a focused and undistracted manner can we respond appropriately. When we listen well, we will know how to help people well. And sometimes this may mean we need to call an audible for a particular day. Now, what do I mean by that? Again, this is a football analogy, so I apologize, but in football, the quarterback always comes to the line with a play in mind. But then he may see something with the defense or hear something from the opposing team's linebackers that indicates he needs to make a change. And he has the right to make that change, to change the play just before the ball is snapped that's calling an audible. He'll scream out audibly to his, his team what they're going to do. And there are times when we come to church thinking our day will go a certain way, that our volunteer opportunity will go a certain way. But then we listen to a parent who's really struggling financially, uh, relationally, emotionally. The pressures are building up. They've had a hard time even getting there to church that morning. Those may be times to call an audible and ask, hey, do you just need to talk? It's okay to skip the service and head to the library right here or, or to the parlor and just listen. You don't have to have all the answers or any answers for that matter. You may just need to listen. And all you say is, that's really tough. I'm sorry you're going through that. And then simply just pray that God would show up in a powerful way for that individual. We call those divine appointments. And when we listen to others well, we get the opportunity to enter into those appointments and be a healing presence in others' lives. And that brings us to the final letter in our acrostic, the E in smile. We want to be a people who will go the extra mile for others. That's what the E stands for, extra mile. This is what separates good guest services from great and I've seen firsthand the impact of that extra mile on brand loyalty. People who know us know we are a Disney family. Even with all the price hikes and other complications with the company, we still love going to Disney World. But we have had bad experiences there too. On one occasion when our children were very small, we had our diaper bag stolen. Thankfully, there wasn't anything too valuable in it. There was no cash or credit cards or phones, but the bag itself was pretty special. It was a Disney-themed diaper bag, and you know, you parents understand that those types of diaper bags aren't cheap in and of themselves. Now, when we brought this to the attention of a Disney cast member, told them about our problem, they took us to guest relations. And at this point, there were a couple of options I know they had in front of them. The baseline reasonable reaction would have been to just apologize to us, tell us they'll check the security tapes, and then be on the lookout for the perpetrator and let us know if it turns up. Now, good guest services would be to add a gift card or a discount card toward the purchase, purchase of a new bag. But extra mile service is what they gave us because they actually escorted us to one of the stores right there on Disney property with similar bags to the ones we had. 
and they told us to pick any one we wanted. And they would give it to us for free. That's as close to replacing the new one we lost as we could have possibly had. They went out of their way to minimize the inconvenience for us. Extra mile. I heard a, another story about a, a 10-year-old named Christopher who had special needs. Now, Christopher loves the band Maroon 5. If you don't know who Maroon 5 are, don't worry. They're pretty huge. Anyway, Christopher actually had the chance to meet the band, but he got so overwhelmed and his receptors were so overloaded about the possibility of meeting his favorite band, he had a panic attack and he crouched down behind his mom before he just laid on the floor. Those of you who've worked with special needs kids before, kids with special needs before, you know that's common. Instead of the band being too busy to deal with this kid, the entire band got down on the floor with Christopher and just waited for him to be ready. Extra mile. We can go the extra mile by listening to others and listening to the Holy Spirit and those quiet prayers we offer under our breath in that moment of our volunteering. And we can be ready to respond with extravagant hospitality. When someone asks, where's the sanctuary? We don't just point to it. We walk them there. And then go the extra mile by introducing them to someone that they might be able to sit with. If a kid spills a donut or a drink on the floor, we rush over and start cleaning it up for them and encourage them along the way saying, you know, it's okay, it happens all the time. If you're so inclined and, and a parent is really struggling, you might offer them your phone number to be a listening ear throughout the week. Or, or, or if that's too much for you, I get that, but make sure you get their information so you can pass it along to one of us, one of the pastors, and tell them we will call and check on them because we will. That's extra mile thinking. That's extra mile thinking that builds relationships and builds community. Because we have such a beautiful physical space here at FPC, beautiful grounds, impressive columns and architecture, it still means nothing if we aren't committed to building relationships with others. We want to be a place where families with children feel like they're coming home when they get here. A place where they can be welcomed, supported, encouraged, and loved. A place where we see everyone. Where we try our best to manage their experience. A place where we initiate relationships. A place where we listen and we go the extra mile as we embody a smiling spirit toward everyone who comes to this building we are blessing them we're blessing parents blessing children and building a legacy of disciples for jesus christ thank you for being part of this adventure with us and may god bless you as you smile